In the heart of the state of the art, at the dawn of the next stage in entertainment, you found no proscenium. indeed found no proscenium the voice of everything immersive i'm your host noah nelson and welcome to episode 371 our best of 2022 special this week on the show members of the no pro review crew will be sharing their top immersive moments and shows of 2022 as we do a little look back nine members of the team and moi all sharing what made this year special for us uh, this is coupled with the uh, best of the, the written form of it, so you'll get even more uh, on the very page that this podcast is on on our site, and uh, you'll also find it in our social feeds. And look, if you're if you're out in the feeds and you find it, share your best ofs and your moments with us as well. We love to see it in the comments. We love to know what has been making your immersive year so fantastic. Be forewarned, there are some spoilers here and there throughout. This is a retrospective show. And so you know, Blake and Danielle segments do go deep into spoiler territory on The Burnt City and From on High, respectively. And The Burnt City is still open. And and Blake's segment is great. I had a lot of fun. Spoilers galore, just, just so you know there, uh, if you're trying to stay pure. Uh, from on high, of course, was in Denver, and uh, it's it's not currently running. It may come back one day. We we hope we hope hope springs eternal. Um, but uh, be also forewarned there. Uh, all that's coming up, uh, in, including uh, like I said, including my segments. So like ten segments are coming up in total. But first. Want you to know right now we have the public auction of two tickets to Unique Trapman O'Brien's much lauded The Tele Library is live. This is the promised follow up to last week's backer only auction. Congratulations to the winners there. These tickets are always incredibly hard to come by, and Unique is pledging 100% of the proceeds on these sales to us at No Pro which I could really use because I have to buy a refrigerator. Uh, like I, I'm, not, I'm not joking. I literally have to buy a refrigerator. Like I said, three tickets are up for auction right now through noon Pacific on the 22nd, also known as next Thursday when we're recording this. The two, uh, the two, it says two, three, I rewrote the copy. The two bids will each take, the two winning bids, oh my goodness, will each take home one ticket for shows that take place in mid-January. Those are the terms. As I record this, the top two bids are $60 and $65, which doesn't equal a refrigerator. Uh, so if you've been dying to catch the telelibrary or des I'm not kidding, or desperate to go back and you're a no pro backer, this is your best chance this weekend to score a ticket. Didn't intend on sharing the refrigerator bit, but it is true. Uh, I guess it's freaking me out. Uh, <laughs> should backers can also still score discounts to rumble in the jungle rematch in london all of this can be found in the backer exclusive part of our patreon feed speaking of we're up to 388 backers just 12 shy of the 400 mark that we hope to hit by the end of the year to stay frosty and cool that's thanks to our latest backer that, that 388 is thanks to our latest backer, Kendall. This is my bit for the week, I guess. Uh, we remain on the right side of the halfway mark of our $5,000 a month funding goal. Imagine how many refrigerators. Uh, sorry, y'all. It's happening. Uh, but I'll admit, we could use a little Christmas miracle. <laughs> Gee, do you wonder why? So if you can please jump in and back us at www.patreon.com slash no proscenium and help us hit 400 backers before the end of the year. Uh, why am I laughing? Uh, if you're a backer, well, those reviews on iTunes on your podcatcher or ch of choice help spread the word. And for those of you who are fleeing Twitter, um, like I did, and then went back because no one else would come, uh, but now they're fleeing again. Yay! We just opened up a Mastodon account currently at no proscenium at mastodon dot social. Tend to stick around there until uh, until everyone starts screaming uh, about why that doesn't work. Uh, and we are also on Hive, uh, which is back up after being down for a few weeks. Uh, who knows? 
uh, I thought no one was going to use it. And then suddenly uh, a bunch of the people I was following were like, oh, yay, we're back. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're doing this too. Wild, wild times. So, so wild. You don't care. Uh, I do, unfortunately. I wish I didn't. Uh, like like Orson Welles in the movies. I wish I wish I didn't have this love, but I do. Um, we're also on the lookout, as always, for community partners who are up for working out special deals for our backers, like the folks at Rematch Live, like Unique has, so many folks. Hit me up at noah at nopersinium.com for details. I know there's someone I, I still got to reach back out to. Sometimes when people write me, and it's, it's right while I'm in the middle of something, uh, that then ends up getting buried because then I get done with the thing that I'm doing, like whatever crisis I'm, I'm dealing with. And then like more emails come in that like have to be dealt with instantaneously. So, uh, but then again, I'm, I'm sure you don't know what that process is like. That was the sarcasm part. I know you do. All right. As always, big thanks to our sustaining backers uh, who <laughs> allow me to get into this trouble. Samuel Mostry, Chris Woolman, Samantha Davidson, Eric Shamlin, Elaine, Jay Bushman, Jerome Joseph Gentis, Tom Leonetti McGuire, Winthorn, Ryan, David Bassick, Richard Ayers, Lonnie Hands on, Sydney Guillory, and Jan Budman. Thank you all for all you do on the regular. And now, a whole lot of the best of. <laughs> It's our London curator, Shelly Snyder. Hello, London. Hello, London. Hello, Shelly. <laughs> Hello, LA. <laughs> See that there? That's fair. That's good. It's good. The coffee hasn't quite <laughs> kicked in yet. Um, I broke down the format for you. So we're going to start with your moment. What was your moment uh, in 2022? Oh, my moment in 2022 was uh, a weird hinterland of a moment. Uh, it was at the top of a staircase in Punch Drunk's The Burnt City, essentially right before you uh, enter the main show, after you've gone through the sort of um, orientation process at the beginning through their their velvet maze of galleries. Before you're let loose into the main show, you are at the top of a, a metal staircase and you have to go down it. And because we've been waiting for a new Punch Drunk show for so long, and because the opening of the Burnt City was pushed back multiple times because of lockdowns and because of safety concerns, at the top of this staircase was so much anticipation, so much hope, so much expectation that you're almost afraid to run down it. But run down it, we all do. Mm. <laughs> into the playground that it goes on for what feels like miles and miles but just that that ooh that shiver of anticipation up and down your spine as you're you're racing to beat everybody else to the the furthest reaches of their compound that was my moment and i think about it every time i refer people to go see this show is just wait wait till you get there mm. Mm. wonderful wonderful that moment the moment of anticipation the moment the moment the moment before um yes. to use the actor's term uh, the moment before um mm -hmm. okay so i i have a sneaking suspicion what what some of the stuff uh you're, you're going to be pulling for your best of shows is, <laughs> uh, given that <laughs> it's but not um fair really it's not fair to anyone else in london I, you know what though if we put that show to one side there okay. were some really amazing shows this year in london um, and I do promise I, I'm recommending at least one other. Okay, good. So what 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 so far? Because I know you're still drafting. Uh, you told me you had two. What what are the two that you're pulling uh, for your best of so far? Well, aside from the Burnt City, my other one that I'm uh, referencing that was so incredible that stood out from many of the others was actually Doctor Who Time Fracture which was an immersive everywhere in BBC Studios production that unfortunately has come to an end as of time of this podcast. But, you know, there's... But what is there's time for the doctor? No, I'm kidding. What is, exactly? <laughs> like, and, and closed, fair, open, 13, 14, 15. These numbers are meaningless. These it's all just comes back to David Tennant. No. Reboot. Uh. <laughs> Boy, God does it. Uh, and because of how many times this show uh, mounted and unfortunately was uh, canceled, was flooded, was remounted, you know, who's to say? It might come back. 
Daleks, Cybermen. Look, they're just trying to keep the show from happening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very accurate. What do you expect? It's timey wimey. Okay, so w- w- we're going to dive. Which which one of these two, Burton City or, or Doctor Who, are you going to dive deep in for us right now? Well, I think in the interest of fairness, because uh, we're going to try to advertise a show that people can actively go see, uh, let's deep dive on Burnt City. Okay. Like we haven't done that, that enough. That- <laughs> well, don't worry. Every time we do, uh, the the numbers go up on the podcast. So, uh, well. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll <laughs> wax poetic. You have you have as much as five minutes to just go off, Queen. So, <laughs> <laughs> don't threaten me with a good time. Um, is is there any particular? route just just go off. Well, yeah. Okay. So let's 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 make this sort of fair for the so for. For those of us who who you know are 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 travel impoverished, I'm just going to use the actual terms. Um, uh, take us into a little bit about what makes this one special, and and feel free because I think we can we can bet that a lot of folks listen have uh, you know touched the face of sleep no more. So feel free to use that as a reference. But like if I'm someone who's who's seen Sleep No More, who understands mm. that as the template for like that's what a punch drunk show is, and maybe I've gone to a lot of other immersive, mm. what is what is it that, that they're doing this time that mm. that makes this one special? Uh, and that sure. seems to be giving this one legs. Sure. So uh the Burnt City is the current uh London answer to You know, if you are around New York City and you go to sleep no more regularly, if you're in London, go to the Burnt City regularly. They just recently opened their bar uh, so that you don't actually have to have a ticket to the show to go to the bar, which is nice, the same way as the McKittrick does. The Burnt City is, I want to say it feels bigger in scale to sleep no more. And I know that that's saying a lot because the New York iteration has five or six floors of performance space. This one has two warehouses of performance space. And I, I think it's either one or two or three floors each, but there are such, the scale is massive. It feels like immersive Disneyland. It feels like you can walk for miles around it. And I know that that's not accurate, but it can feel like it at times, especially if you've caught yourself between scenes, but There's so much to explore. There's so many tiny spaces. There's big spaces. There's tons of actors. From what I remember, I feel like there are less one-on-ones, which will help cut down on audience aggressiveness. I know that we do occasionally have issues with audience members chasing, shoving, you know, opportunistic omnivores trying to get in there. But this one is much more accessible. So we we see issues uh, at Sleep No More because the spaces are smaller. uh, They're more sort of claustrophobic and intimate. Here, because the spaces are so huge and so tall in many instances, the performances have gone vertical. Mm. There's, There's aerialist portions of it. There's performers up on platforms. They do a lot more up and down performance. And that means that more people can see. You don't have so, so many people it, squeezed into one space. It, so, th- so they're they're deploying a lot of spectacle in this piece, yes. is what it sounds like. I mean, there's there's Very there's moments so. of spectacle in in Sleep No More, uh, particularly you know down in the in the basement ballroom space. Uh, mm. Some some pretty big spectacles happen there, but mm-hmm. those are those are rarefied moments in in the the run of the show. It's it's the it's the hub and the hub and spoke sort of structure yes. but but this this sort of is happening kind of more consistently as you're going going through i would definitely say moments? that this show uh the burnt city is more accessible uh, mm. and i say that in a in a theater realm that um historically we've seen in the immersive industry uh intimacy and um one-on-ones are sort of what a lot of us chase Whereas we see this emerging trend in immersive theater, at least over here on this side of the Atlantic, 
where we need them to be more accessible. People who have walking issues, people who use wheelchairs, people who have accessibility concerns have seemed to be boxed out of a lot of immersive shows just because of the trend of the industry. And so yeah. what Punch Drunk has done with The Burnt City is while not all of it is super accessible, much more of it is than I feel people uh, have difficulty struggling with at Sleep No More, they might not be so struggling with at The Burnt City. Well, that's a good that's a, that's a good trend line. I mean, we yeah. all know that some of that comes from you know the spaces that have made available to the makers. You know, like uh, of course, like out, outcast. <laughs> you start us outcast. <laughs> found you, space, you, yes. Yeah, you found spaces, and you get what you can, and and you hope that the arc for a company is as it gets more success, as it has more resources at at its disposal because of past mm. success, that they are able to dedicate those resources to expanding the audience to, to more folks, um, to, uh, to increasing okay. accessibility. Um, yes, and what Punch Drunk really um, reaps from this is because of their Arts Council grants over here, which, of course, in London, the Arts Council grants are much more robust than they are in the States. Because they were able to make- What's an uh, Arts Council grant? Um, <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, There's free, an Arts Council? Oh, my God. The, I'm <laughs> free moving money back. from the no. government <laughs> to make- art, which is incredible. So because Punch Drunk has made this major investment into the neighborhood in which they've built the Burnt City, mm. and because they had the capital to buy the property that they bought, they were able to invest and make this incredibly sweeping, beautiful production. And it's not just the sets. It's not just the number of actors and the, the staging of it. Investments like sound design which I will always wax rhapsodical about, you literally, you feel like you'd be passing from a courtyard into, you know, a, a shop right off the courtyard. And yet the sound change is so immediate because of the design that they've done. Uh, there is no audio spillover from the space that you just left. Their investments into scent, into perfumes, into the smell of the areas as you pass through them is so strong and so detailed that, you know, you have fans who are trying to find those perfumes in the real world. There's, you yeah. know, we think that uh, like Demeter Perfumes, I think, has uh, been outed as one of the designers. Um, I think that they just recently released a scent called Pomegranate Noir by Joe Malone that is now being chased as like the gift for the holiday season for the punch drunk fans. Yeah. So anyway, yep. all this investment that they make makes shows like this so singular and such a deep dive and worthy of revisiting. Well, Shelly, thank you for giving us that <laughs> breakdown uh, and, and spinning up even more FOMO. So thanks for that. Uh <laughs> <laughs> You'll come over here soon. I'm sure. I hope so. Like, nice. but we'll, we'll save that for for offline. Um, nah. You know, it's it's literally. I have I have two major trips uh, at the top of my list of the things I want mm. to do with my life. Uh, we all know what they are, so let's not. Worry about <laughs> it. Anyway, Shelly Snyder uh, holding it down for us there with that huge team. You're 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 uh, you're wrangling in. Yes, life. thanks we have again expanded. for. Yes, you have. So thanks again for all that work. And uh, we're going to – we'll have you back on soon. The vaults are coming, and I think there's 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 a lot more. There, people, uh, Odds are you're going to hear a lot more Shelly uh, in the year ahead. Uh, but, uh, in fact, we're going to go talk <laughs> about Fingers crossed. <laughs> And we haven't heard uh, Kevin's voice on the podcast in a hot minute. Now, uh, Kevin Gossett, LA Reviews Editor of NoPro, is here for his turn for the best of uh, 2022 segments. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Hey, I'm um, doing pretty good. Excited to be recording this. Uh, we do the moments, and then we're going to do the shows. So, Kevin, what was your moment for 2022? So... My moment's kind of weird one because I can't actually like speak to the actual moment because it's a spoiler just in case Joe ever comes ever comes back. So oh. it's from I cut myself I cut myself shaving it bled so much. Um, there's a moment kind of close to the end of the show when it like, and that's a that's oh. a Candlehouse Collective. Yes, it is uh, a Candlehouse Collective show. 
it was part of their uh part of their what their their fire starter fire initiative, I think. Fire starter? I, guess, I think they called it fire starter. Something like that. Okay. Sorry. We're not operating off notes. Shaw. <laughs> um yes, yeah, so there's this point like close to the, the show where it like ties together all the themes in this one kind of like choice you have to make during the show. And so you spent like almost three hours kind of like talking to the various characters in this world. And then this thing happens and it kind of like it, it crystallizes the whole show. And it's like, Oh, okay. Now I see what, I see what the show's doing. I understand what's happening. And then you actually have to make the choice. And it's like, it, it should be an easy choice, but the, the show takes the time to like really build up to like these pieces. So it makes it harder to make and you may not make the choice you like want to like think you should make or want to make um, because of how kind of elegantly it's, it's put together and ties kind of these various things um, into this, into this package near the end of uh, end of the show. Well, interesting, a real, a real moment of sort of narrative tension uh, that, that, uh, that gets you on the slow burn level. Yeah. And it, and it really feels like, a choice. I wrote in my piece that um, sometimes immersive, it you're presented a choice and it really feels like you're picking a path. Like mm. where do you want to, based on the choice, like where do you want to end up? And this one actually feels like you're, you are doing that in some sense, but it's pretty well hidden in like the, the build up to it. Um, so right. it doesn't feel like it's like, I'm just going to go this way or I'm going to go this way. And I can kind of tell what's going to happen either direction. So you don't really like know. And it's like, even if you do know, kind of sense like where it might go uh you might not make the obvious obvious pick there that that makes a lot of sense to me i mean part of the art i think part of the art of storytelling that everyone's getting reacquainted with right now is that yeah you can have plot choices but if the character work has been done uh properly then what might otherwise seem like a fairly arbitrary you know, do you want the, you know, door A or door B? Like, whatever, I'll see it all, can actually feel really significant, even if, even if the stakes are kind of low, or even if, uh, like, on, on kind of a, mm-hmm. you know, uh, interpersonal, not an interpersonal, but like on a, on, a, on a macro scale, right? Like, maybe the stakes are very high for personal reasons. And, and it's that character work that makes all the difference in the world um, of something that can be very simple, but, because they made you care it's just like the biggest deal much like life yeah you know yeah so you know and that's that's good it. immersive theater when it uh, when it clicks like that very good very good all right so that was your moment um let's talk about what you wrote about for the best ofs all right just let me throw all three of them out yeah and then we can kind yeah, of yeah like, cho- toss all, right. all three out and then and then <clears throat> and then you know you'll you'll pull a thread from the collection all right so I put The Light in the Mist, which is a uh, post-curious like puzzle tarot game box, which is super cool. Um, I think Patrick wrote about it on the site at some point. Um, and he was actually the one that like reading that made me like interested to go seek it out and like sub- uh, pay for the Kickstarter. And then I finally got it this year and played it. Um, my second one was Dragon Show The Extended Tale, uh, which is from Spy Brunch, LA Company. And it's kind of like this like interesting little piece um about dragons and fairies and it's kind of like delightful but it's not like super like too whimsical and then um i don't think this one's going to come as a surprise uh uh 40 watts from nowhere uh because it was excellent just an excellent piece of theater nice um which one do you want to pull the thread on um so i think i think kind of maybe tie all of them together i think i I think i probably talk about this a lot anytime we do year-end stuff is like that intentionality in like creating a show and kind of making sure all of the pieces serve the the through line of the show, whether it's the the plot or the characters or the people's um, the way they experience the story. And I think all three of these have a focus on that in different ways. I think 40 Watts is just like such like a realized piece of, of theater that I, I don't feel like it has been done before this kind of like interactive immersive documentary type thing. Um, that's really clever and just like everything runs through that, like your experience in like a period of Sue Carpenter's life. Um, Dragon show is, is obviously much, much different, but it feels so like kind of thoughtfully and artfully put together to like give you this kind of like joyous experience of 
being in this fairy, like this fairy like village and talking to uh, dragons and dealing with the kind of problems and that comes with that. And then yeah. the light in the mist. I don't know if you've seen the, the tarot deck from, but it, it's like, it's such a nice like tarot deck of major arcana and minor arcana and all the puzzles like are spread out across the whole deck and it ties into the story. And each one kind of has like this emotional resonance based on like what's happening in the story and what's happening in the puzzle. So it's this kind of like, they all have this like very specific sense of like intentionality and how they've built the show. And it's like, it's not just like random immersive pieces kind of slapdash together. It's very like, this is what we want to do. And I think all three of these like really achieve that in really different ways. With the light in the mist, uh, it, it functions. I keep on asking this every time someone brings this up. It functions <laughs> as a tarot deck once you're actually done with the game as well, right? Yep. Like it's yeah, like, you just have a have a nice tarot deck to kind of sit around in. Um, and it also comes with one more, like a packet that I think you can let someone else play it if you want to pass it on too, which is oh, nice. Oh, very cool. That's cool. And then, yeah, like, you know, I'll, I, I may, I haven't decided yet. Like I'm, I'm reserving my right once I listen to everyone's to like, you know, try to balance out the force as it were. Um, but I may wind up talking about 40 Watts at some point during all of this. Uh, that's entirely possible, <laughs> but it's, I wanted to point out. About. Oh yeah. But I want to point with dragon show. Cause that was one I didn't see. And then uh, Nick Rimel Jones of spy brunch uh, held a mixer, uh, you know, in, in his backyard or where the sun mm-hmm. is. Uh, and we got to see the elements they had built and we got to see the dragon puppet that they had, yeah. had constructed for it. Mm-hmm. And I was just so blown away by what they had physically made Yep. And it was really sort of sad that a lot of like there was all kinds of reasons, you know, why people didn't wind up catching this one when it when it ran that second time. But I was just like, oh, man, like they really went all out with like the build. And it, it's one of those moments where it made me rethink about how folks market their stuff and and how it would have been really incredible if they'd held that mixer at the start of their mm-hmm. run. And like giving everyone a little glimpse of like, th- these are the things we're doing as opposed to like, yeah. you know, you know, hiding sort of, sort of the classic immersive thing of like, oh, we're going to hide behind, you know, mystery and marketing. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. You got to show some of that stuff off because also it's, it's so incredible in space that even some pictures are not going to ruin it for people. You know, it's like yeah. going to And that's really not gonna ruin with it. that one that was like, I, it's it's shocking how much like existed in like a relatively small small footprint there too like um but i think that was one of the main like the production design was like so high and it felt handmade but not cheap um and it really just kind of yeah. elevated the show into that kind of like whimsical feeling and yeah i i wish it had run longer because it was this was one of those ones it was like i'll send so many people this show like it's like this is pretty easy like an entry point for for people into immersive theater, it's like it's it's gentle. It's got a little bit of kind of every flavor of immersive. It it looks super cool, um, and it's just kind of like in line with all the stuff Spy Brunch has produced. It's just like a really really solid show. I I don't know what the fate of all the stuff is. I assume that some of it just went into storage, but maybe maybe there's a chance they'll play around with that show or play around with that mm-hmm. format and. And, you know, let the legend grow for a minute as people, you know, hear word that they missed something special. Um, and sometimes that's that's all. That's the most you can ask for. Well, Kevin, uh, you and I have another appointment we've got to go uh, get ourselves to in not too long. Yeah. So uh, and, and people get to hear that next week. Uh, but thanks for hopping in. Let us everyone know what, uh, what your picks were and what a what a fantastic uh, collection and selection and what great insight yeah. into why. Thank you. Now in our uh, seemingly endless lineup of no pro contributors, we have Katrina Latt, who is coming to us from Toronto. She's our Toronto contributor. Katrina, it is so good to talk to you again. Hey, Noah. How's it going? Oh, it's going all right. It's going all right. Uh, it's, it's it's a long day of these. <laughs> There's a lot on the menu today. You're the first uh, for on the recording session, a little behind the scenes. 
Um, as everyone listening to the podcast knows, we do moment and then we do the best ofs. So what's your moment you want to tell us about this year? Well, my moment of the year, and I feel like it's a bit of a cop out because I'm here in Toronto and I should pick something in Toronto, but uh, maybe it's recency effect. I'm not sure. Or maybe because it was just such an amazing moment in general. Uh, But I think my moment would actually be during the Denver Immersive Gathering, which I had the opportunity to attend in the beginning of November. Uh, And it would in particular be exploring Meow Wolf. Um, There were moments in there that I just felt like an absolute child. I broke away from my group. I was wandering around exploring all these secret passageways. Uh, and there was one moment in particular where there was this like one little gap that was a little bit too big, too, too small for me to go through, but I was able to, to sneak through it. And I just felt like an absolute child just exploring and being the best of my imagination. So that moment is very special for me because I really felt like I connected with a part of myself that I, I hadn't seen in quite some time. Oh, that is truly, truly lovely. Um, and no, it's not. It's not a cop out. Like you know, it, moments are the the fabric on which immersive are made, and they can happen anywhere, anytime. Heck, they can even happen in things that aren't immersive. Although, of course, you know, meow will very much so. Um, that is really wonderful. Um, and I, I'll say, like one of the things I was thankful for when it came to the the dig was getting to meet. Uh, getting to meet you and Danielle mm-hmm. and other folks who, you know, are part of our far flung uh, group of, of, of immersive folks. And, uh, and yeah, so that makes, makes it tickles, it tickles me that, uh, that, that the dig was your moment. So something that was not <laughs> everybody. It's like, it's not some ad for what we do. Nope. Um, it right. was a great what event in got- general. I, I hope, I hope you all do it again because it was just, it felt like it was good for the soul. Just nice meeting everyone, talking to fellow immersive lovers and creatives and all that. So thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, well, definitely, def- there's definitely plans. Things are, things are stirring. Um, so let's slide over to the best dev side of things. So okay. what are you going to be writing about before, we, before we dive deep on one, what are you going to be writing about this year? Yep. So I have two shows in particular that I did want to write about. Um, The first being A Grim Night by Transcendence Project. And the other one being, uh, and get ready, this is a bit of a mouthful. It's Trojan Girls and the Outhouse of Atreus by Outside the March. That is, that is, that's, that's got some, some verbs to it. Some some (laughs) words to it. Does it have any verbs? No, it doesn't. Not a single verb, just lots of nouns. (laughs) (laughs) Um, which one do you want to dive deep on today? Uh, I think in particular, I'm going to dive deep into A Grim Night um, by Transcendence Project. Uh, in particular, I wanted to talk about it because it's coming back. So I, I had the opportunity Ooh. to see it, um, I forget, I think it was uh, a couple months ago. I think it was still cold outside, so probably beginning of the year-ish. But it's actually coming back uh, March 31st, April 2nd, and then April 6th to April 9th. So I figured it'd be a good one to talk about because um, it's not just a retrospective when I'm talking about it. This is something that everyone could go and check out um, if they happen to be in Toronto this spring. What made this one, you know, top of top of your list for the year? Or to- towards the uh, year? Yeah, I think what made it top of the list for top of the list for my year, um, I felt like of all the experiences that I did in Toronto, it's the one that felt most immersive to me. Um, mm. uh, for I'm sure, pretty much everyone is familiar with Sleep No More and the concept there. Um, what Transcendence Project there Transcendence Project did is uh, borrowing of some of the elements in there, but whereas Sleep No More was a retelling of Macbeth. This one uses uh, a bunch of the different stories from the Brothers Grimm. Uh, And so similar to Sleep No More, you're you're wandering a a space, they've they've got the dancers who are telling the stories, everything is on a loop. Um, And it's the first time I'd really seen something like that in Toronto. So it really reminded me of the the first immersive theater project I had ever seen, which was Sleep No More, and reminded me just why I love immersive so much. Yeah, that, that, so there's, it's a, it's a full free roam then yes like, yeah oh that's gotta be that's gonna yeah. be a lot of fun and there's something there's something really smart about taking you know like when when sleep no more does the scottish play or you know then she all played with you know the material from alice in wonderland there's there's something about going into the old parts of the canon and for a while it was almost like a trope like everyone was doing it but it feels like a lot of folks have been exploring new works like generating new work 
uh, like completely original. But there's something about you know, digging into the canon that lets everyone focus on the experiential side a little bit more because you're not worried about whether or not people are are following the story. It's like they they mm-hmm. have a template of the story in the, in their head, and so they can focus yeah. more on you know, what's being presented, the experience itself, the twists on the tale more than necessarily, you know, like, well, what's the plot here? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd say, I mean, the first time I saw Sleep No More, I'm, of course, f- uh, familiar with the story of Macbeth, but it had been some time since I had studied it in my, in my high school English class. Whereas um, the Brothers Grimm fairy tales, everyone has had those ingrained in them since a young age. So I didn't have to um, remind myself what was going on. It was very natural to me and I could just fully immerse myself without having to think too much about, okay, what's, what's going on here? What's the story? I, I just knew. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Well, um, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm glad you, I'm glad it's coming back and, and that's exciting too, because we get to point everyone uh, mm-hmm. to it in Toronto and hopefully uh, get folks, uh, get folks excited and get folks out there. Um, I hope you have an excellent end of the year and thanks for thanks. for spending a little uh, little of your of your december with us today of course it was an absolute pleasure thank you so much noah and i'm, I'm glad we finally got to hang out at the at the dig me too me too <laughs> fun fact the segment we're about to do with Nicholas Fortuno uh, is actually the first one we're recording uh, this year. Maybe it's the first one that we're going to play in the podcast. Maybe it's the last one. I don't know because I don't know what's about to happen, what Nick's about to say. Hey, Nick, how's it going? Uh, good, good. How are you? Oh, <laughs> that's a loaded <laughs> question. Uh, don't worry about me. Uh, I'm sure the audience already knows. I'll tell you afterwards. Um, uh, as I was setting up, uh, as we started the call, uh, going to talk about your moment and then talk about, uh, talk about, uh, one of your, your best ofs. Uh, so why don't we just, let's start with that, that moment, that ephemeral, uh, little spark that, that stands out in your mind this year from all of the various, LARPs and immersive theater and installation art pieces that I know you have gone to. Yeah, so um, for me, I if I had to give a moment to anything, I would give it to Delusion. And the moment I would give them is, you know, at the beginning of the piece, you're you're kind of in this house and you're having these, you know, sort of set up encounters. And it's all very like I'm in a set uh, room with a bunch of props in it. I can look over the props and there's an actor talking to me. And then very shortly after that, without spoiling the rest of the haunted house experience you're loaded into the back of a truck and you you kind of jump in the back of a truck and then you're driven to someplace else and it's not very far but it's nothing you could have seen from the front when you came in which was just like a big house and like a little outdoor area where they had like a gift shop and stuff and so when the truck stops um it's under this premise that the person who drove the truck doesn't know you're in the truck and somebody is chasing after the truck who's going to let you out and she lets you out of the truck and it when you step out, there's this, this field of like dug up graves in front of you with this like house that's boarded up, that's like lit red inside. And when you turn around, there's just a set of individual trees that are like front lit. So they're just like standing out of the environment. And I've never been in such a large styled space. It felt like I was, I was, I was in something that was like almost cinematic. And the actor was scared and responding to us scared and starting to move forward. And the whole thing was driving us forward. But I was just thinking about like how much had to go into that moment to make that huge space, just this wonderful introduction to a horror story. Um, Not just in terms of the set design, but in terms of the acting and the lighting and just the the sort of thinking about environment. Um, I had never done anything that was at that scale. Right. That that was like the whole environment is meant to take me in in this outdoor setting. And it made me realize, like, you know, how far, um, you know, this this kind of like immersive set design practice can go when you when you really have access to space and control over space. So that was the moment. 
Uh, what three are going to get name checked in your write up? Yeah. So the, for this year, uh, the three that I, I think were the strongest that I saw would be uh, Particle Inc., Bottom of the Ocean, and then the VR piece, This Is Not a Ceremony. So of those three, which one do you want to pull out and talk about? I, I would like to talk about Bottom of the Ocean. So Bottom of the Ocean is is fascinating to me because it uh, it's structurally doing something different than a lot of the work I've seen, which is that it's a ritual, right? You're participating in a ritual. It's not so much like a theater performance exactly because there isn't really a story right and the story is sort of implied in the piece and when people have asked me what it is i've and and you know get a get a description of it i say it's like oh it's like you went to a spa by a probably benevolent but slightly creepy cult um and i and i mean it like that's that's what it is to me and i think that's a really <laughs> it's a really fascinating way of making a piece of work which is that like i'm going to immerse you in a narrative space not by telling you a story, but by building a story world around you in the sense that the ritual is part of that story world. And so from that perspective, the experience is narrative only in this like kind of um, implied way, right? Like it's, it's much more about just my journey through it, but my journey through it doesn't totally make sense unless I add my narrative to it. So I, I have to basically be participating with it the entire time. And as a way of doing narrative work, I think it's really interesting, right? Because I think a lot of narrative work relies on telling you a story and a lot of gameplay right. um, asks you, right, to like engage to make the story happen. And immersive theater tends to lean more on the theater side, but this is one of the few things I saw leaning more on the interactive side, right? That That your actions and your reactions are where the story lives without it being gamey like it didn't need points it didn't need feedback it didn't need um any kind of like like very core decision making it was just the idea that i'm engaged in this meditation and i accept this value system for the purpose of this experience and then i go through highly stylized highly spectacled moments of ritual that to me is is such a powerful way of telling stories that i think um I think that that, that 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 group has so much potential to explore that form more. You know, I think that the next pieces that come in that line are going to be very, very inspiring in terms of pushing this ball forward on whole other ways of thinking about what interactive narrative can be. It, it, it's funny because it made me think about the fact that you know Andrew, uh, the, the the lead creator uh, of bottom of the ocean, uh, you know, the founder of house world, you know, first and foremost, he's a musician. And I always think about this broad field of uh, immersive experiences as, as not just being a, a, a narrative form or like story, not just in the sense of telling a story the, the way, you know, a three act structure would, but maybe telling the story or opening up a world the way a song would opening up the world the way a poem would it, it's not necessarily you know um, dramatic characters posed in front of each other and 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 our observations of their behaviors but it's something different it's there there are other ways of kind of wrapping a person's soul up in the the, the emotional arc of what's happening that's that's what I started thinking about when you, you were talking about um, you know, it's 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 not gamified, but it's interactive, and it's it's a story, but we're essential to it. Do do you think that that some of you know these other practices, I mean, this non non theatrical, uh, you know, like in the the theater sense, um, that that Andrew's bringing to his work might be influencing this exact kind of other type of storytelling that they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I definitely think so, because I think that there's and, and I'm not knocking this, right? There's a theatrical instinct to present. Oh, yeah, a no, story. let's be clear. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, like, like the stuff can be really, really powerful. Like, you know, like, like Particle Inc. is showing me a show, right? Like, that's what it is. And I do things. But I mean, there's a show there, right? And um, it's not like there aren't those elements in Bottom of the Ocean, but it more resembles what you see in live action role playing, where a lot of the staff participation is meant to simply be um, the negative space or the sounding wall for the player experience, right? Like 
my, you know, when I run a LARP, my NPCs are not there to show off or to perform. My NPCs are there to basically be a rebounding surface for the players. And that to me is what I felt in that piece, but in a, this different way, right? Because it, it wasn't doing it you know, from a highly narrative form space to begin with, it was looser. And you start to see, you know, things that, you know, questions about like, well, what is the role of an actor in this piece? And what is the role of the story world in this piece are different when it's not meant to be showcasing a story for me. And I think that that, you know, what kind of Andrew's working towards in this is a little bit of this decentralization of the spectacle more towards... Yeah all of those elements of spectacle serving the purpose of my internal experience. And that I think that, that's what the potential is that I think is really strong. And I agree, it comes from a different instinct than theater, but it requires, I mean, you have to have the theater there because that's where you can get that spectacle from. Right. And I've argued right. many times when I teach the stuff that like, it's the intersection of those things. It's like what theater brings and what games brings that, can form this new kind of work. And I think Bottom of the Ocean is just one thread that demonstrates that. Yeah, and there's there's almost something of a, a paradox to it all of because it's not spectacle focused and because so much of it is focused on your experience that even from one point of view, you know, you're the protagonist, you're being centered, you know, it, it could be read as all very selfish and narcissistic, but because we're not showing, you know, a hero, you're not seeing a hero, you're not, you're not reflecting on being a hero, you get this paradox of understanding that you're just one person involved in this structure. You're, you're even even in these stories where maybe you are the chosen one the 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 whole environment around you all the people around you everything around you carries a a, a huge uh emotional new narrative weight uh that that something that you know your cinematic cambellian hero's journey all puts on the chosen character Mm -hmm. uh, and and everything the lens sees them and and because here the biggest thing is you are the lens you're the camera um you you, you suddenly cast back out and see how important the world is and it, it is paradoxical in, in in its nature there um it can be read both ways but i but that's the thing for me that makes all this stuff most like life we are all at the same time the most important character in the world because we've only got our eyes to see through and also we are just this little drop in an infinite ocean uh and both things are true all at once no and i think that but I, mean, I think that insight is really is keen because it, it means that i don't need those kind of stakes to make the story meaningful right like it, it, it doesn't have to be mm. heavier than just my own experience right because my own experience is enough to fill my life right and so building art out of my own experience that way frees me in a way from like the you know like the, the the heavy 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 consequences and the and the very narcissistic centering of like heroism right it's just yeah i saw three other people in the lobby of bottom of the ocean i know they're going to have the same experience i have to some extent but <laughs> it's it's my but it's about my particular experience right it's the drops of my particular experience and i think about that um, you know, and I, I think about that as I just kind of think about work. Um, um, and I'm trying to remember the name of, of Yannick's work, um, that was just showing in New York city, uh, recently. The undersigned. Um, the undersigned. Or Thank undersigned. you. Right. And yeah. like, that's another example of a piece that's doing this, right. Where it's, it, it's essentially like there's a performance in it, but that's not critical, right. That's, that's there to frame my own experience and that the weight of, of undersigned comes in this moment, if it works for you, of your own decision making. That's not performative because you're not performing, right? Like that's you're just responding to something that's happening. And I I'm very interested in that because I think it it means like I think it's exactly the point you made, right? That like it means these stories don't have to have that kind of weight. We can tell much smaller stories and still have them be emotional powerful because we don't need the heroism. It's it's all targeted around you 
right? And it deals with your perceptions and like the power of your own experience. But it also means that the performance weight shifts into these sort of moments of like what you choose to share and how you choose to act and, you know, how much you're committed to this ritual space that you're in. And I, I think that opens up new ways of thinking about what an immersive um, experience can be. And so for me, um, I like Bottom of the Ocean. I think it's I think it's pretty. I think the performers are great. Um, there's an amazing moment of sound that that is very transportive. Um, so there's things in it that if I was just going to talk about immersion in the general sense, I would say are still true. But what really impressed me about it was it was committed to not telling a story, right? Instead to just being a ritualized experience in a story world. I was not in normal life when I was in bottom of the ocean, but I was not watching, and I'm just going to use your language, not watching a heroic story. I was engaged in a ritual and I went through an arc of a ritual and it ended appropriately. And I felt an aesthetic experience through that without those trappings of theater. And this isn't to knock those things because the other two pieces I named were both stories I was told, right? <laughs> so I like those too. But this is the one where I'm like, there's a direction here that I think is new. And I think there's a lot of space to explore. All right. Well, Nicholas, thanks for sharing from your set. And obviously, <laughs> we, we struck a nerve, at least with me and hopefully with, with the rest of the audience as well, uh, by diving into this uh, topic. And uh, I hope you have uh, a wonderful holiday break and a happy new year. Oh, thanks, Noah. I, I look forward to hearing yours and everyone else's. Uh, good year for Immersive, I think, coming back from a slower period for us. And now, Patrick McLean, our Chicago curator, is here for his turn in, in, in the booth. Uh, Patrick, what was your moment? This year, I think by far and away, my favorite moment occurred when I was playing The Last Clockwinder. This is a VR game from Pontoka. And the, 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 this game's so magical to start off with. You are essentially in this kind of like steampunk sci-fi setting. And you go into this amazing clock tower, which doubles as a tree that is a home and a workplace. And there's all these great reveals and music cues and uh, vocal performances. But the moment I fell in love with this game and I think about constantly is the first puzzle because this is essentially a Rube Goldberg automation puzzler where you keep encountering more elaborate ways to do things. And the first one, you have to deal with this blusher garden where you have to plant harvest and like process these seeds for fuel to run the clock tower and as you figure out a way to do this through any way possible you can create whatever solution so i love the freedom and agency this game gives but then there's all these little things that occur like the more robots you play which mimic your movements like there's more music the more uh, of the fruit you harvest like the score picks up and soon there's a melody of all of these sounds and music, and there's a real sense of accomplishment that you can look back and see, I did that and I did it my way. And that's just the first puzzle of this game. And it only goes up from there with setting and tone. And I just absolutely loved it. Very cool. I, I, I love the idea of a puzzle that has room for expression and that also like gets reflected in the the overall design like the in the sort of the the storytelling happening in the world that those being kind of intertwined uh that's something that that's always a, a joy and a delight so it made me very curious about this one all right moving on uh aside from moments everyone knows we're also doing events slash shows and i've been asking everyone what they're writing about before i ask them to tease out a bit about one of them so what's, what hit your best of list this year? Yeah, I have three options, and it's a little bit of a variety, uh, I think, compared to a lot of the other staff members, not to throw some shade, but I, you know, I don't necessarily need a live 
per, a live performer to be part of the immersive experience. I, you know, I just recommended a VR game, um, and the one I'm going to talk to a little bit will have no one. So I have a little bit of a, a variety here, and I'll start with that. I'm first here locally writing about the House of the Exquisite Corpse 2022. This is from Rough House Theater Company. They're a local horror puppet experience. They do something every spooky season. And this year they really went big and there was some really exciting pieces that I'll talk about. And they really played with scope a lot. Additionally, locally, but with uh, pivoting to a different medium, I also really loved Lonely Hearts Special Edition from Birch House Immersive. They too do a yearly show, but it's a Valentine's Day themed show. But this year, in keeping with uh, safety protocols and being COVID minded, they did a at home box experience over several weeks. So you got several packages. And I was kind of blown away that their signature ability to ask poignant qu questions came across in these packages without there being a performer. I thought that was really amazing. But then the one that I just absolutely loved as well as the light in the mist from post curious this mm. is a escape room at home box where at this point everyone who's listening probably is really aware of what these boxes entails you open it up with yourself or either a group of friends and for the next one to four hours you're sifting through documents solving puzzles maybe putting them into like an online app or a website to get the correct solution to continue on. But with the light in the mist, this is a tarot card deck and a booklet, and that's it. There is a, you know, a website to put in solutions, but there's no random documents. There's no like gating necessarily in regards to it, other than making sure you pull one card at the beginning and one card at the end. But like the last Clockwinder, you can really go in any direction you want. And additionally, as I said, like there's so many just like things in a box, like puzzles in a box, just go through them. And to because you think that this medium's kind of gone as far as it could in regards to what it's available, you know, and to have this experience where all of the puzzles, all of the clues are on a fully functional tarot deck. You could then, after you're done playing this, either gift it to someone else to keep using it, or if you are into tarot, you could use this as your deck every day to, you know, see what the future may hold or get guidance from the deck as you see fit. And I just was so blown away by the ingenuity to put a fresh spin on the at-home experience in leveraging something people use every day in a new and fascinating way. And I think that speaks to what I really love about this last year in total and all of these experiences that I felt like a lot of experiences did stuff at the height of the pandemic experimenting, but then they pivoted back to another medium, maybe their medium that they're best known for in person, at home boxes, so on and so forth. But they took lessons from the things that they've learned and applied them in new and fascinating ways. And the light and the mist, I thought, just really upped the game in regards to what you could do as a mystery puzzle at home and how it can be done. There's also something to the the way you framed it there about like you know, taking something people use every day, and mm -hmm. that, that's not necessarily how people think of of a tarot deck, but but it's true. Like there's there's hundreds of thousands, not millions of people you know, this in this country alone who like use a tarot deck mm -hmm. every day. Uh, and there, it kind of throws me back to, you know, thinking about the early days of ARGs and this idea of, you know, the ability to kind of enchant the mundane or enchant the world um, with this extra narrative layer. And that was one of the things that was so magical about that, right? This, this idea of like, oh, if you just, if you just turned your head a little differently, you'd see the world mm -hmm. in a new light because we've made a story for you there. And this is doing that with, with physical objects and, and playing in that same space that, that just like, I'll oh, just, just, just view things just a little bit to the side and it opens up a whole new space. And, and that is so much the, one of the core 
you know, aesthetic and even thematic threads of immersive as a discipline. You know, it's, it's always one of those tools that, that in, in the palette that people reach for. So, well, Patrick, that's, that's a, that's a great set. So thanks for, thanks for bringing that in today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Can't wait to hear what everyone else is going to be when the podcast drops. Joining us now is Daniel Look, our Denver correspondent, uh, who I got to meet at The Dig this year, uh, much like uh, I got to meet Katrina, uh, which is cool. Uh, I'm actually recording this right after recorded Katrina, so like that's very much on my mind. Danielle, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I'm making it through. Uh, what... Uh, everyone who's listening to the show so far knows the format. So what moment, uh, what what was your immersive peak immersive moment this year that you want to talk about? It's so hard uh, to always narrow it down to just one, but I knew right off the bat it was going to come from From On High, which uh, was Odd Knock Productions' first feature full-length show in Denver this year. And uh there was one particular scene in that show that really stood out to me for a lot of reasons, but the the main reason is because it uh, involved water. So mm. um, a little bit of background on From On High. It's a satirical 80s. Uh, in, it takes place in the office. It's a, a made up office place. And it starts off pretty pretty standard, typical office stuff. And then things start to really go off the rails and you start to get the sense that the characters are all headed towards a a mental, emotional breakdown. And um, so this was towards the end of the show. And because this is a a show where there's multiple tracks and they're all happening at the same time, um, you, you have to just pick one area to be in. And then you do in fact get to witness one of these emotional mental breakdowns and they were all fantastic but the one that stood out to me was uh by the the character's name was chad and uh we were referring to it as a chad's baptism after mm. the show was over because that was i think what they were going for or or some some spin of a of a weird bizarre baptism but yeah so the, he's he's kind of in contemplation he's been given employee of the month uh and he took that title from someone else who has gotten it every year or every month month after month after month and so he he seems a little um maybe distraught over that i'm i'm not exactly sure he walks over to the wall and turns a handle and a a curtain of water just starts to fall along the back of the room and uh, the, the space where that actually happens is kind of a transitional space going from one room to another. And you walk past it many times during the show and there's a big, long white pew right there. And you're like, you notice it, and uh, but you just always walk past it. Well, now the water's falling onto this pew and Chad starts to kind of slowly undress, taking his shoes off. He strips down to his undershorts and just starts to kind of let it all out um, through choreographed motion and dance, um, but he's in the water. So he's sliding up and down the bench and then he's down on the ground um, and and sliding on the ground there. Um, and it was just, it was really unique and really stood out because of the use of water and not in a, you know, kind of surface level way um he is drenched by the end of that particular scene oh wow and so then uh it 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 continues on from there uh he's you know i don't i don't know if he like kind of through that moment was able to to shed off the um the trials and tribulations or the stress or the trouble i i don't know if that was like i think it was supposed to be like a cleansing moment for him and then he he walks into the corner executive office and does more of this movement. Um, he's up on top of the desk, um, and eventually he goes over to a, a chest and opens that up and pulls out this. Uh, I thought it was a blanket, 
Uh, but it was a, a whole bunch of suit jackets and ties that had been sewn together into this very large uh, cloak that he uh, drapes over his shoulders. And then there's this geometric ox that's hanging on the wall. It's been there the entire time, but you know, just think it's like decor or whatever. But he actually pulls that ox off of the wall, holds it by the horns, and then just he's almost in like a trance-like state at this point. And then carries that um, back to the main area where we resume with the other characters and the other um, guests who have watched their respective emotional breakdowns. But again, Chad stands out because he shows back up completely drenched in water. It sounds absolutely visually intense uh, <laughs> to, to be to be that up that up close, something like that. All right. That's the moment. Uh, yeah. What are you writing about w- for best of the year when it comes to shows? Uh, well, I'm I'm writing about that show from on high from Odd Knock Productions. Um, I just I'm I'm such a fan girl over their work, um, and I think that uh, the the performance that they put on with From on High was and I'm not just saying this to say it because it sounds good. It was unlike anything I've ever seen or witnessed uh, in the immersive realm before. Um, And so it was just, it was really, really um, groundbreaking work, I think, Um, especially compared to what, you know, we've seen in Denver for the last few years. It just kind of is on a, on a, a level all by itself. Um, but the other thing that I'm writing about uh, was um, a production called Salt Mother. And that was actually put on as part of the 2022 Denver Fringe Festival. And that show was interesting because it was a 15 minute performance built for an audience of one. Oh, tell us a little bit, since you, you went deep on, on, uh, from on high a second ago. Tell us a little bit more about Salt Mother. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it was impressive to me because as I said, it's just a 15 minute performance, but uh, a lot happens and it was, it didn't really hit me until after the show was done, uh, that I encountered so much, um, as I was looking back and, and kind of reflecting on the experience, uh, that was when I realized kind of the roller coaster of emotions that they took me on. Um, it, you know, you show up and, and you don't really know what to expect because you know you're the only person. And how's that going to work out with this performance for a, a person, a, an audience of one? But right off the bat, the, they brought me in and they're, oh, hi, Danielle. How's it going? You know, what have you been up to tonight? They sat me down in a chair. They offered me some snacks. Um the other people who I didn't know were introducing themselves to me. Hello. And then, um, then it, it had this like support group kind of feel and vibe to it. Um, and so then it, they started to kind of bring me into the purpose of the meeting, which never really became super clear to me, but I just kind of started following their lead. They were, um, they were doing some chants and they were standing up and then they were sitting down um, and I was just kind of following along and they kept talking about the salt mother and the salt mother was coming. And I got the impression that if I, if I didn't participate or, or do what they were doing, that I might upset the salt mother. Um, so I wanted to meet her and I didn't want to upset her. Um, and then when she did finally arrive, um, she just, uh, I described in my write-up, I described her as intoxicating, and she was. She commanded the room. She was beautiful, um, but she also, she was stern, um, yet warm, and uh, it was it, it was very interesting how, without really knowing her or her purpose or my purpose for being there, I did feel drawn to her. Like I said, she commanded the room. Um, and then, you know, pretty quickly she left and then the, the meeting was over and um, it, I, I didn't even really register it as this until it was, like I said, until it was done. But it, it felt very cult-like to me. Um, and I felt like, you know, they were love bombing me the moment that I walked in and then they 
introduce this fear of the salt mother and if you you know upset her what what might happen um and it just it all happened so quickly before i even you know could register what had happened and like i said after the fact i started thinking about it and wondered if that was the night that i almost accidentally joined a cult <laughs> oh luckily luckily a fake cult um yes <laughs> which 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 given you know in immersive there's been a few fake cults over the years where people have gotten tattoos because of you know like uh maybe maybe what's is there a difference i don't know well that sounds like you've been having uh, a lot of fascinating adventures in denver as, as denver scene continues to, to to kind of warm up and expand it's been quite the year out there uh and i'm, I'm glad we have you out there uh checking out all the stuff And now it is a Blake Weil, our East Coast editor at large's turn in the end of year best of hot seat. Hello, Blake. Hi, happy new year and good to be back. So everyone listening knows how this goes. Let's start with your moment. What was your big immersive moment for 2022? Uh, okay, so spoilers ahead for those of you sensitive about Burnt City one-on-ones. But my top immersive moment for 2022 has to have been my extended, quite long one-on-one with Hades in the Burnt City. So if you will let me set the scene, uh, picture this. It is the darkest, most masculine, clubbiest, old-timey office you've ever seen. You know, the 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 mahogany paneling, some horrific Hieronymus Bosch painting above the desk. I don't know if it was actually Bosch, but it might have well as been. There, you know, big leather armchairs by the fireplace, dim flickering lights. And, and here is Hades, played by the perfect, wonderful Sam Booth. Big push broom mustache, shaved head. And he, he brings me into this office and just stares at me for a while, and we have awkward chit-chat for about literally five to ten minutes, which I realize sounds like not much time, but in terms of an immersive theater show, might as well be an eternity. And, you know, he's asking me, well, you know, do you like my city? You know, oh, people comment on the quality of the light here, and I'm trying to keep up, but this is all so overwhelming. And eventually he he turns to me, he looks me dead in the eye, and he asks me, and I will never forget the inflection, he goes, would you like to see my wax museum? (laughs) Which... (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Exactly. It's like full Vincent Price hammer horror camp. And so I'm choking on Exactly what I was going to say. That's exactly what I was saying. I was like, "Look, you you just fell into an alternate universe with a different version of Vincent Price." Like, holy it's, hand. It's, I'm losing my mind. And then, so already, this is like epitome of Blake's nonsense. This is the highest camp, the highest like full pastiche land. But he goes right this way, right this way, and he's he's like Vincent Price meets Rex Harrison almost. He's like just giddy about sharing this with me, and he brings me into a back room with a nothing but a big mid-century modern armchair and a record table, which he describes as his wax museum. And oh, this ex- God. Hipster bullshit. That is great, God. though. Like, oh, uh, everyone needs to steal that one. Jeez. It gets My wax even museum. creepier. It gets uh. even creepier because, you know, he gives this fabulous monologue comparing the the concept of either a wax cylinder to a record to almost the looping structure of a punch drunk show. See how it spins around and around. You can't even trace where the loops start and where the loops end. And oh, I love it. I love it. It's this great yeah. meta monologue that then once you step out of the room record playing, well, I forgot to mention this one on one was the beginning of the show. And now that the record's on. Full cast has come out. You can see them everywhere. It oh, is wow. his wax museum come to life. And this recontextualizes the entire show as being about, 
you know, the idea of what we leave behind. And in Greek mythology, which is so obsessed with legacy, especially in the Trojan cycle, it just really gave this interesting frame story that shifted the whole evening. And really, that record motif, once you know when to look for it, it shows up over and over. And so yeah. not only was this just like all of my total and complete obsessions, you know, condensed into this moment of Vincent Price silliness, but it's also eye-opening for the rest of the show. And it was really a moment that both collapsed all the themes into one moment, but then that moment expanded and enhanced all the themes. It went both ways. And that's why it is the number one moment for me. Oh, that's that's a that's a really incredible moment. Was this something just to clarify, was this something that you you just got randomly pulled for? Was it something that you bought? How does cause the old days in Sleep No More, like if you wanted to get pulled up to the, you know, the the hidden floor, that was that was just a random they chose that occasionally. But this is the beginning so of the show, there, kind of a similar vibe. So there are still a handful of one-on-ones that are considered sixth floor adjacent. Fans of Kronos, I'm looking at you. Kronos, I I have not had his one-on-one, but I hear it is the sixth floor alike. But the Hades extended weird one-on-one is just his loop one. Before Persephone shows up, Hades just spends that loop, or at least he did back when I was in the show, pulling people into his office, having weird extended chit-chats with them, giving them a one-on-one. And it it really is this startling, horrific intimacy um, where you almost feel like you're dealing with both the director of the show, you know, the whole thing, spoiler alert, kind of takes place in Hades, but you're also dealing with a fanboy of the show. And so you're in this awkward position of being with someone who is in a position of power over you, but just excited to have a fellow audience member to talk about their favorite story with. And that is a oh. really neat frame device for the whole show. And it, it's a popular one-on-one. Um, now yeah. that I'm not going to say, say it's, it on it's air. Loop, it's not, when you say it's like loop one, it means that like, you know, he, he does this a few times. So like a few people get this before things start. A few on. people get this or got this a show. Yes. And, yeah, you know, I was, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, I, I heard Hades was interesting from a few of the no pro staff who had seen it before me. And who oh boy, is he compelling? Um, Sam Booth is making a lot of fans. My only, like, real regret is that I'm not over there now that Mallory Grayson has transferred into the role of Persephone because, my God, I think they're my two favorite actors in the Punch Drunk roster. To see them working together would be a oh, dream come true. Here's hoping I get back soon. All right. So we, we went long on moments. So uh, let's let's jump into your best ofs real quick. And what are you bringing to the table this year? So the Burnt City, of course, and I've gone on long enough about that, but then was a a recent edition, Undersigned, which got in just before the bell. You know, that was really tremendous, and that's Yannick Trapman O'Brien's latest work. But then the one that I'd like to go into a tiny bit more detail about is uh, Chatterton Cabinet of Curiosities, this year's show at Hempstead House. Let's do it. So Hempstead House... And the Sands Point Conservancy, I should say, puts on these fabulous Halloween productions in this gorgeous old mansion. And Chattern and Cabinet of Curiosities is not the world's most thematic show. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. But it, it deserves a spot on my best of list for just sheer fun. There needs to be a celebration of the sheer joy and structural beauty that you can find in immersive theater. And that was it this year. The whole show is this daffy mystery horror thriller about an eccentric old family and their bizarre incestuous vibes and their obsessions with taxidermy, trying to figure out who murdered the most beloved son of the grand matriarch uh, and eventually his return and revenge uh, with perhaps a supernatural angle to that. But, Everything from the show, from these bizarre, uncomfortable scenes with these eccentric characters, the German housemaid yelling at the uh, 40-year-old woman dressed like Shirley Temple, trying to force her to take another pregnancy test, the uh, scenes of the adopted son who was the quote-unquote playmate of the beloved grandson, 
uh, tying down and forcing sedatives onto the Grand Matriarch uh, as a role reversal as the caretaker. But it all has this bizarre comedic tone, and it ultimately culminates in, I kid you not, a live David Lynch stylized vivisection in the basement operating theater with everyone in these weird, like, bright red, half latex fetish, half like satanic chic operating theater outfits, except for that the main surgeon. Cr- that sounds a little Cronenberg, more Cronenberg than Lynch to me. And that sounds oh, like, but what is it? You're, dead, you're missing dead the reckoning? bright red bright red curtains and checkerboard floors and all the like okay, weird okay. hallmarks of Americana wealth. It's surreal, but everything keeps this sort of bananas tone and they keep passing out champagne. I'm like, whoopee. I had a great time. I am good. I would literally drive six hours for one of their shows. Fortunately, I only had to drive two and a half, but I, I would drive six hours for them. They put on such a production every year. It's, Oh, what a hoot. Full recommendation Fantastic. to everyone. Fantastic. All right. Well, that is that is great. And the good news is is that they they do it every year. Uh and the other good news is uh you know the unique show is 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 going around and Burnt City's still there. So uh folks have a chance to catch all three. Uh someone wants to to follow in your footsteps in 2020. Oh. All right. For once I'm not recommending one shots. I'm thrilled with myself. <laughs> Very good. For this segment, we've got Laura Hess, who is the arts editor of No Proscenium. Laura, everyone knows what's coming first, so bring it. <laughs> okay. So my best moment, which you'll be able to chime in on, my best moment of 2022 um, was my the first glimpse of seeing Monuments which is by Australian artist Craig Walsh at the Without Walls Festival uh, in San Diego this year. Um, This is a site-responsive outdoor projection art piece. And these are faces that are projected onto trees. So this is something that you see at night. This is illuminated. And as you can imagine, the, um, the faces move as the trees move, as there's wind that comes through. It's incredibly evocative as the faces animate, which I mean, they're filmed, so they're already animating a little bit, they're blinking. But then as they're animating in tandem with the trees, I thought this was an incredible piece. And it is really timely, um, especially as we're there's been a lot of social unrest and people of color are rightfully protesting monuments that are you know dedicated to racist public figures and the way that Walsh who actually started this project in the 90s um, is really calling us to question who are how are we dedicating monuments to people who are we dedicating those to and in this case the monuments are predominantly in this projection art um, Again, indigenous people, women, people of color, and there are stories that then you can read about those people. And it really humanizes monuments in a way that feels much more grounded, much more connected to who we should be celebrating in our public spaces. And I can and I can speak to it a little bit in that 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 first moment, right, when you when you see it is just it just kind of stops you in your tracks, it takes your breath away. It does. <laughs> There's there's something just about seeing a big face in black and white, you know, kind of almost like blue is the white, right? It's almost like in black and blue, like light blue, almost almost like a hologram in Star Wars. Mm. Just for reference, I'm not saying like it, you know, it's not Star Wars obsessive, but just to give you a, a tonal sense. <laughs> and and it's uh, it really is striking and arrayed in such a way that uh the trees and the faces like they kind of they blend you know so there there's just all these layers to the piece itself um and yeah really if if it's coming through your town for a festival or whatnot i recommend taking a moment and and it's it's deceptively simple simple and i think especially the scale too i i think that it is it's such expansive 
uh, and emotionally resonant work. And I think especially as other projection art, um, which again, I know some people have very strong feelings about, but as that continues to make its way through uh, different cities and and people have a chance to experience that, this is a, a very unique kind of projection art that I think is so beautifully harnessing the very things that make that kind of art so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. All right. That was your moment. Mm -hmm. What is making your list this year? (laughs) Okay. So what's making my list is I'm sure there is some repetition. We certainly talked about it with the group end of your podcast segment. Um, I imagine that some of these are showing up on other people's official lists. Uh, the Stranger Things experience, I think it absolutely knocks it out of the park. Um, and I've tried to pull from some different genres and, and sort of different models, but these were also hands down my favorite things. Um, 40 Watts from Nowhere. I cannot get enough of the crockers and the spin that they did on this so beautifully designed. I also think that docu-immersive, it's not as prevalent as fictional narratives, and I'm hoping that more people will step into the space. I do also want to give a shout out to I Agree to the Terms, because all of these other examples from my list are in person, and I Agree to the Terms was a live and interactive online production also docu-immersive, and it was absolutely stellar. This was done by the Builders Association uh, in collaboration with uh, some of Amazon's MTurk workers. So um, remote and digital, we talked about it last night. Um, I still think that it is an absolute playground and creators are innovative and we want to keep that going. The third... Yeah. Oh, so th- sorry. <laughs> the third. Go, go for it. Okay. Well, the third one, which you've also, I mean, you've seen everything on this list, except I agree to the terms. So the third one that I can speak to a little bit more is a forest for the trees. And mm. so this is, I think my theme, as we talked about last night in our theme, our sort of thesis for 2022 was thoughtful. And I really agree with that. I think the theme for me really specifically around this list is holistic. And I had talked about in my review for Forest for the Trees, which is helmed by the amazing artist Glenn Kino and is um, produced, uh, is, is it, it's a collaborative partnership or what I love that Kino refers to it as a conspiracy of support between the Atlantic uh, magazine, Super Blue and MasterCard. Um, and I referred to this as holistic immersive in it's ethical and inclusive practices. And again, Kino is, is really the ground zero for all of this. Um, and holistic as a theme extends to those other productions too. I think in their design and all of their choices and intentionality, these are really holistic productions, really understanding who their audiences are and what reactions they are hoping to generate and how they want to connect with those audiences. The intentionality and the design was so holistic in the ways that they fed into each other. So I realized that was my theme for 2022. All right. Well, if you want to, if everyone wants to go more in depth, uh, Laura's best of are on the site in written form, along with everyone else who you're hearing today. And, uh, yeah, thank you for spending a little time here before the holidays uh, to let us know what uh, your immersive year was like. <laughs> All right. I have been told by our next guest, Leah Davis, our New England correspondent. Wait, wait. Senior editor, New England curator. What do, what do we even... What is your title these days? You you referenced in the end of the year, uh, saying the thing right, but then like fixing the title. But I can't remember what your title is. Right? I don't know. I, I mean, let's go with a, a senior editor. Senior editor. 
senior editor. Um, but I was just so excited because the last like three times I've been on the show, I've forgotten the word for correspondent. And I, I just was so excited to say it last time that New England correspondent yes. just came rolling out of my mouth. Yes. Um, and, and indeed, you are our correspondent in, in New England. Thank you. So you're also part of the, the senior team here. Um, and uh, you just promised me that what's about to happen is a surprise. So uh, <laughs> what's your, at this very moment in time here towards the end of 2022, when you look back and you think back and you just feel your way back through the immersive year you had, what's your moment? What's the one that's Okay. Out? Well, I, I want to be clear. It's it's not a surprise. Like I'm keeping this from you. I um, I'm going to be just as surprised about whatever comes out of my mouth right now. And it was um, exciting. I know, isn't in it? It's the impact. <laughs> Love it. This moment. Okay, Back to my, my roots. moment. Ooh, all right. I'm a little bit surprised. Right, I'm I am surprised uh, because you know what's floating to the surface right now is um, a moment from a show that I've had a complicated relationship that with this year. Mm. Do you, can you guess which one it is? Um, no, no, I can't. It's it's Lennox Mutual. Oh my goodness! The very thing I that know. you owe us words on. Yes, so much so. <laughs> All right, finally getting you to talk about Lennox Mutual. So what was the, so so we're not gonna we won't go fully mm-hmm. into. But for those who don't know, Lennox Mutual is is this experiment from Candlehouse Collective. Uh, it is an ongoing series that has some ARG like elements. It's these series of phone calls with this company Lennox mutual um but what was what was your moment what was what was the moment that that you're thinking of right now and maybe it's the key the the key to the whole thing <laughs> it's also the most interactive um, of all of these have been so far <laughs> we're, we're in the group i am i am still i'm still really in the thick of this show so i think i've i've called maybe seven times um I've explored a, a whole bunch of different options. And then the, the moment that I'm thinking, of, I've got two moments. Can I do two moments? Pull one moment. Everyone gets one. Oh, 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 oh. okay, okay. In, in, unless um, the two moments, unless they have to link up in order to, to create a, a holographic, they don't make sense without each other. Then mm, I'll, I'll let's see. No, no, I think I'm going to, I'm going to talk about one very specific moment. So um, yeah, there's a point in the call. Um, and I think this is all right to say, I don't think this is exactly spoilerish, um, but there's a point at the end of the call where your representative asks, um, do you feel like you spent your time wisely? And uh, this was maybe my sixth call, fifth or sixth call. And up until that point, I've, I'd always said yes, primarily because um, I'd always made the best decisions I could with the information I had. And that had been more or less my stock response. Um, and I, I had just come through a very frustrating call. Uh, mm. I hadn't been able to do some of the things that I had wanted to do. I had had a few options disappear on me. Um, I had tried to sort of finagle my way into getting a slightly more human interaction with my call operator, um, who, had, who I'd had some moments with in the past. Um, and I think I'd had the same call operator for a handful of times at this point. Um, and she asked me at the end, did you spend your time wisely? And, you know, I don't know. Uh, I was frustrated and I said, no, I, I don't think that I did. Uh, and she paused. Mm. Yeah. Which was wild because one, one thing that I, just as a, as a life philosophy, I, I kind of believe that however I'm spending my time is I'm doing it well because that's what I'm doing. Right. It's very hard to spend right. time poorly. Um, so, so I said, no, I, I, I don't think I did. And she paused and, I felt a moment of concern in her voice and she said, well, why not? And I really had to think about it then, right? Move beyond that moment of frustration. And I thought, well, okay, well, why am I, Whew, take, a, take a deep breath. Why, why am I feeling frustrated? What do I, what do I wish that I'd done differently? And I realized it's not that I had wished, I could not have done anything differently. I still continued to make the best the best decisions that I could with the information I had. But what I really wanted out of this experience was a more human, more human interaction. I wanted a connection that I mm. didn't feel like I was achieving in this, in this show right then. Um, and so I, I said that I said, you know, Josephine, I, I think that I was looking for something that I'm not going to find here. 
I was looking for a human connection. I don't think it's here. You know, this is not your fault, Um, but this is why I I think that I need to maybe look elsewhere. And in that moment, I, of course, I felt very connected to her. Right. And because we were sharing something very real, I was no longer trying to get something out of the show and she was no longer trying to drive something out of the show. And, um, and she paused for a moment and then we ended the call and for the first time, a little after, maybe maybe a few minutes after, I got a text back from Lennox Mutual from, from Josephine and um, she answered some questions that I had posed to her earlier that she had sort of ignored. And, you know, she sort of said, I apologize. I had never answered this question and it was, oh God. It was about fear uh, and about a parable of a bird chipping away at a crystal mountain. And she shared some information about her relationship to that story. And Mm. it was intimate and it was beautiful. It was also um, phenomenally manipulative in a way that I really appreciated. (laughs) And that's when they hooked you and you were back in. (laughs) Right. So like, here's the reason I'm choosing this is it, it, it was a moment of connection that I, that I enjoyed that the kind of stuff that I really enjoy in a show, but it also surprised me because frankly, I'm, I'm a very canny immersive theater audience member. And I feel that I can generally, whether I intend to or not, um, manipulate the space in the show around me to get results that I want if I'm looking for some kind of result. Um, and I hope that doesn't sound awful to say, (laughs) but yeah, I but mean, like, these, these are these are these are sandboxes, right? You know, there's sure. there's there, there's a level, and generally we know what the social contract in one of these pieces is. You know, you you tend to know where exactly. the numbers are, and when the the show's experiences have you know a, a human element, when there's characters who are connecting, and if they're if they're probing into you, and you're answering honestly. And then that performer is answering, you know, in, honestly back. And I, I put air quotes on honestly, because it, it might be them answering as a person, as the performer. It might be them answering as the character. Uh, sometimes these things are indistinguishable. Um, that's kind of where the magic is. Like the raw yes. magic, you know? Well, um, yeah. So, so I, I completely agree. And man, there's an interesting conversation to be had there as a LARPer. I think that there uh, is a lot of room for authentic and sincere and deep human connection, even if you're not necessarily playing yourself. Um, oh, let's so, hold that one. Let's hold that. Yes, maybe, maybe let's. we'll do a whole episode about LARPing. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, uh, hmm, <laughs> maybe. Um, but, but what I, what really got me about this moment was it was connection. Fine. Um, but it was that I had one, really not been able to manipulate my way into the connection that I'd been wanting earlier. Mm. And two, that I had been surprised and delighted by the entire experience. Like it had not gone how I wanted. I had not been able to predict most of what was going on. Um, I was rewarded for lack of a better term with a kind of connection that I wanted, but in a way that I had not anticipated. Um, in a moment of vulnerability, in a story, in a in a thing that I had really not seen coming. So, like, I think I'm choosing this as my moment. This is relatively sort of banal in the scheme of things. It was a phone call and a text um, moment of immersion and storytelling for me because it really just encapsulated all the things that I love about immersive, about about being in a space that being in a world that somebody else is inhabiting with me uh, and and maybe discovery, I think. Um, surprise, delight, and connection ultimately. I yeah. I dig it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we went really long on moment, but I don't want to steal an opportunity for you to tell everyone what's going into your best of list. Okay. <laughs> um, my best of is really just the one show. I, I only wrote about the burnt city. So that's a spoiler. Um, I think you all should go read it because I wax, uh, 
episodical and, and, about. And, and I believe one of our most listened to episodes of the podcast ever is the one where oh. me and Shelly talk <laughs> about the Prince City. So if people really want to get the 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 deep deep down deep on burnt city from you there's there's a whole episode of the podcast that is you and shelly talking about it so the, you know the, but what i've got i've got to tell you though i agonized a little bit about choosing burnt city as my as my best of because i generally prefer smaller shows and i, I want to highlight independent work um and i just like i enjoy really personal intimate smaller endeavors um but there's something about Burnt City that just does it for me. And I think it's primarily because of the autonomy that the actors have um, mm-hmm. within the confines that Punch Drunk has created. Um, that really that, that really does a lot of that for me. Um, there, there is a lot of autonomy. There's a lot of different kind of chemical makeups of both the actors and, and the story together. Um, there's a lot of space for human exploration. It's just, it's, it's beautiful. And it smells good. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it smells like theater. <laughs> the, the, the there's there's a lot of talk about how this thing smells. I gotta say, like, it is seems there like really? Gonna, oh yeah, Blake Blake uh, put it into the um, oh, gift guide this year because people have been figuring out the sense. Blake brought it up or is going to bring it up. I don't know what order these are going. You know, probably uh, Blake's will probably go before this one. But like, so I'm not spoiling it. I gotta make a mental <laughs> note. Let's see if Noah remembers. Is he gonna remember? Um, I may just do them all chronologically. That'll be the easiest thing for me. Um, it comes, it comes up a lot. There are people, there's like, there's whole sections. Again, people have already heard this in this episode, unless I'm spoiling something there. There's Reddit's been trying to figure out what all the perfumes are. Man, I need to go online a little bit more often. Cause I, I think about it. I've been to the show a handful of times. So every time I go, I think, I wonder if I can figure out what the smell of the, Oh yeah. Cause, cause go talk to Blake, is. hit Blake up. Blake up knows, Blake knows where all that stuff's going on. <laughs> Got the whole um, list. I think I think Blake then, has you ordered know, some of the colognes. Wait, really? oh Jesus Christ! Honestly, I'm I'm behind the times here. Um, well, good. You've been this busy. Is why we Work's do this. Been hard. This is why we have a community. Exactly. <laughs> this is what we do for each other. It's funny because like because because after you, Laura and I did a segment, uh, and then afterwards we were talking about. Um, uh, she she had bought something off the gift guide, and then they went and bought some more stuff, like bought more copies of it off the gift guide, and then we started talking about how one year we all bought something off the gift guide. In fact, by no, what not off the gift guide, we did the best of in like 2020. There was something, and because everyone was waxing poetic about something, the rest of us went out and bought out the rest of the runs so there was none left. <laughs> So it was just us. Got it. Because we were just like, that, oh, that sounds good. Let's go. Was right? it the adjacent yeah. possible? It must have been like the adjacent possible. No, it wasn't possible adjacent possible. It was, it was, um, it was uh, this great plague or something like that. I can't remember. There was, was oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I I, we we're just talking about it. But but this this is the thing, right? Is like my and my joke being like, if we just make the no pro staff big enough, then we could like change the the fortunes of creators. <laughs> So we get a hundred really? people on the staff and then we can really help indie creators make it. We can just sell out a show or an experience on our own. We become our own economic force. Uh, At this but, point, people uh, say, Hey, should I listen to the podcast? And I say, I don't know. Are you a, are you an immersive creator or <laughs> are you already working for Nova? Let's go. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, should I listen to the podcast? I don't know. You want to work for the podcast? Uh, yeah. Let's do it that way. <laughs> Never thought of this as a possible uh, solution to our problem. It's just like let's just and keep recruiting until until there's there's nothing left left but us. All right. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always so, a pleasure, Noah. <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I yeah, so much. It just sounds like we're just. I think Leah and I have this thing where like we sometimes sound like we're dismissing each other, uh, but we, we never are. We're just like affirming each other's weirdness. We do this one hundred percent. Thank you on the show and in real life. It's 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 a true joy. I'm going to start crying <laughs> with joy. It's great. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I better stop this recording. <laughs> And you know what that means. That means it's it's my turn. It's the end of the show, but there's still a whole segment to go, which is me, and there's 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 nobody but me. So let's let's get into it, shall we? Um uh Noah, uh what was your moment? 
<laughs> all right. So for me, the moment this year, uh, uh, all of you know that, well, uh, anyone who, who's, who's been here since before November, uh, no, we did the Denver Immersive Gathering. We were part of that uh, in, in Denver in the beginning of November. And part of that experience uh, involved getting to go to uh, Meow Wolf's Convergence Station, uh, the, the third of the, the Meow Wolf inst- you know, uh, permanent installations to open, and uh, and also my third. My third, I, I, I sort of did them in a release order. Wow, I didn't realize I did them in a release order. But, but the moment wasn't going there. No, the moment was this. So I had all of 45 minutes in the space because I was working. And, uh, but I needed a little bit of break. And I wanted to wander around. And so I went in and got out onto C Street, which is what they, the, the sort of the, the kind of a cyberpunk, uh, you know, bizarre market at the heart of the station that, that a lot of spaces kind of squirrel off from. And it's where they drop you off if you take the main elevator. Um, so for a lot of people, it's, it's sort of the first thing you encounter. And uh, within a couple of moments, I ran into uh, Jaden and Spencer, a couple, of, a couple of my friends who live in different parts of the country from each other. Uh, Spencer uh, up the block from me and uh, Jaden uh, on the East Coast. And uh, it, was, it was lovely running into them. And uh, I, I, we, we, we ran around for like a good, a good 10 minutes or so and just started like exploring and finding stuff. And, and I was stoked. And then uh, I sort of, I, I drifted off from them because I had, you know, only so much time. And as I came out, it's like past uh, this school bus that's like embedded into a wall between this kind of like uh, intergalactic garbage dump and, and C Street, uh, I, was, I was crossing through and, and trying to figure out where I was going to go next. Uh, a payphone rang and I picked up the payphone because what do you, of course you're going to pick up the payphone. Uh, and I just, I just start BSing. I started improvising with the person on the other end of the line. And after about a minute or so, the person goes, is this Noah Nelson? And I just vehemently deny it. Uh, while I also drop a hint, uh, I, I say something coded that makes it clear that yes, yes, I am Noah Nelson, but I, I was because completely, you know, you're not going to say yes. Um, and then I kind of go about my merry way and, and wind up uh, in not too long in this like ice cavern, crystal cavern thing that's got a couple of mecha in it. And it's all very interesting. And I and I run into Abel Horwitz, uh, who's also there because, you know, everyone's there for the thing, you know, uh, but I but I run into Abel and Abel uh, and I start talking and uh, within moments it becomes clear that it was Abel <laughs> who was on the other end of the of, of the phone he he could not see me right so he wasn't guessing uh based on based on line of sight but i'm just completely delighted by this and uh and then we start goofing around and his family comes and, and takes some some goofy photos for us uh of, of like me in this mecca chair and, and abel's like rolling around on the ground you can see the photo on the website right now uh and uh <laughs> it's just completely ridiculous and then we kind of wander off uh, together for a bit and then we part ways. And then I wind up in this big mycelia forest and, um, and climb through these structures, uh, up, up, up on, on, onto a catwalk, a series of catwalks. And, uh, I, I run into Jaden and Spencer again, uh, even though I, I left them universes away and just that, that there's nothing I love more than than that feeling of just kind of leaping from tree to tree from sort of, sort of, uh, uh, experiential branch to experiential branch of, of running into familiar, familiar, familiar characters in this case, real people. Um, it just all, it's what makes life feel magical to me on the regular. And here it was condensed down into this like 45 minute bit. Now look, you know, like, Obviously, you know, it's a, it's a whole bunch of people I know, you know, are in this thing, but also there were so many other people in there. Like it would have been really easy. I spotted a couple of other folks, but there are plenty of other folks I knew who I just didn't, I didn't run into, uh, you know, while we were all running around this place. And it was just, it was just magical. And, and it all feels like a fever dream. And I have retained so many little details of that 45 minutes uh, that I can play out over and over and over again. And 
I don't think that it would be as easy to do such a thing, even given the, the running into friends, uh, if it weren't for the, the depth of detail in that space and the, the sheer amount of effort that has gone into it because it primes you to just be on the lookout um, in a real way. You're just open in a way uh, that you that you aren't necessarily otherwise. So kudos. I've got my Q pass, which I actually like just a team member just handed it to me, like someone from there, you know, I didn't even buy it. Sorry guys, I got a free boop card. Um it's it's like right in front of me right now. It was in my wallet forever and I took it out yesterday and now now it's now it's in my hands. Uh so uh that's that's one of the things from uh Kimberto Stations. It's kind of bent though. It's gotten all banged up in my wallet. All right. That was my moment. Um what, what am I writing about that is not Convergence Station? Well, look, I, I went back and forth on this one because uh, there, there were some things uh, that I thought about. Look, I'm going to tell you right now. I thought about putting Aster Lumina on, on the best of. Uh, I, I was worried about recency bias on that one. I do think it's absolutely spectacular, and I, I want to go see all the uh, Lumina Nightwalks from Moment Factory now. Uh, so, you know, if, if someone knows how to, like, hack a billionaire's account and send me a bunch of money. I will, I will go on that travel log for us and bring along a videographer because I'm, I'm not one. Uh, and, uh, I was thinking about putting uh, the stranger things experience on because frankly, uh, I think it's maybe the most significant immersive, uh, thing to open this year that, that isn't, um, you know, a uh, galactic star cruiser. I haven't been to Galactic Star Cruiser, so I can't put Galactic Star Cruiser on my best of. Again, billionaires, uh, the, the door is to the left. Um, just uh, go on to the, uh, go on to patreon.com slash no percentium and select the give me all your money uh, option. Um, <laughs> no, we actually have a tax-free donation page for that if you, if you are ridiculously rich uh, and, and want us to live, live our best lives. Uh, hit us up. Uh, that's at, uh, experience the next stage.com. Um, that's actually, that's actually true. Um, so, but both of those didn't make the cut, um, because there were three experiences that, uh, hit me, uh, more fully emotionally. Uh, and, and these are, these are personal best up lists and not highly deliberated, uh, editorial best of lists. Because um, we've done versions of that in the past, and it's just this isn't game of the year, man. Like we've all seen and experienced different stuff. Uh, getting a consensus would would be, I kind of feel intellectually dishonest, at least at this stage in the game. So the three that made it for me this year are Forty Watts from Nowhere by Mister Mischief here in L.A. I saw it at the Without Walls, uh, and then. Uh, also making it in is um, Immortality, the video game by uh, Half Mermaid. That's uh, Sam Barlow's company. Um, and and I, I, I did waffle a little bit on this one because, but we, we did review it. And um, it, it, it is a video game. It is, it is self-contained in that sense. But it, in so many ways, simulates without you having to leave the interface, the feeling of an alternate reality game, all of the kind of emotions, all of the connection you get, uh, say with, with a, uh, a boxed experience. It just happens to be a video game. Uh, it, it feels like a cursed object that you're, that you're dealing with, um, which is what the best boxed experiences do in, in so many ways. So, so it's in the wheelhouse. It's in the wheelhouse. I read about that one, but the one that I'm going to talk to you about right now for just a hot minute, because this has gone long, we're almost at two hours now, is Particle Inc. Speed of Dark, which just uh, closed its run in Las Vegas after, I, I think, maybe a little bit more than six months. I, I haven't looked at the timelines again. And I think it's, it's particularly apt given that, you know, one of my pieces, 40 Watts, is immersive theater with escape game, you know, influences that are all... Um, you know, repurposed to make something new. Oh, also, I want to point out um, that there are other things that we encountered this year that that I encountered that I did, um, but that opened in other years. And so I I did what I could 
to to for my best of like stick to our, our standard rules so so you know there's other stuff that i want to i'm going to flag that like ministry of peculiarities could have made the cut but it opened in 2021 um it's all of a sudden wrong if it opened this year guys sorry <laughs> you would have made the cut um but back to particle ink real quick so um you know 40 watts had has you know the theater the physicality side and uh you know immortality is is a piece of technology right there's there's technological stuff going on and particle ink merges those two worlds of the the digital effects and the physical performances in a way that is just this cut above anything else I've seen. And I've seen a fair amount of work where you have performers interacting with projection mapped objects and characters. I've, I've seen plenty of Cirque style performances. I've seen plenty of projection mapped things, some of which have been fantastic and, and, and mind blowing all on their own. The way in which the light poets, the creators of this show have merged these two worlds, have relied on the skill of the performers to help the audience believe in the reality of the projected characters. It's just the purest form of wonder theater I think I've ever seen. And they, they meld in moments of participation. They give you little bits of agency to traverse and reveal secrets of the space. It's not a show that's incredibly aggressive on the narrative agency side. But that bit of traversal and the way in which the central act of, of watching the digital and the physical interact seamlessly just creates this illusion of being in a magical space, of, of being in a, in a liminal space where, you know, two realities are intersecting. And it's all make-believe. But it's done so well that you can kind of spend your disbelief in the same kind of way that a, a great movie wraps you up. In, in the same way that, uh, you know, a punch drunk show, you know, the, the fact that you're in a warehouse moving around like falls away because of how compelling what's in front of you. That elasticity between your belief, your body, and what is in front of you and what you're moving through and around and is, and is swirling around you and, and responding to you. They've, they've baked all that in there. Um, like I mentioned, the show closed at the top of the month in Vegas. Um, I, I haven't talked to the creators in, in a minute, so I don't know if there's another spot that they're landing or if they're retooling or if maybe this was it. I sure hope this wasn't it. Um, I, I sure hope that maybe their original vision of New York or, or, you know, selfishly, maybe Los Angeles or, or maybe somebody out there is, has helped is helping them figure out how to, how to take this thing around and move this thing around, around the country, um, in, in a way that, uh, makes financial sense because in a world where, um, <laughs> in, a, in a timeline better than this one, I would want not only everyone who listened to this podcast, but everyone I could think of, and, and then a thousand times more people than that, to be able to see this show because it was truly, it's truly something special. It's one of the most special things I've seen while I've been on this beat. And that's why it's, uh, it's on my best of the year list. And you, that's all you got to do. You just got to impress me beyond uh, all belief. And then uh, <laughs> that'll say nice things about you on the internet. Oh, man. All right. Well, um, we've got the end of the year show next week. Um, and, uh, we've recorded one of the segments for that and, uh, we're going to schedule the other one. I got to format this best of post, uh, with all the writing parts, the podcast will be on it. 
Uh, if you're if you're listening to this just in the podcast feed, know that if you go to the website, you're going to find all the written up parts. Uh, and, and there's some other folks who didn't get on the show. And then there's some folks who didn't <laughs> didn't turn in their writing. <laughs> that one's easy to figure out if you listen to the whole show. But uh, but hey, you know what? You listen to the whole show. So you got it. You got it all. You got what you needed. It's, you know, we do it for you. All right. Um it's almost it's almost two hours. Let's do let's do the end credits. The associate producer of this podcast is Parker Sala. Music for No Persinium is by Chris Porter of the Speakeasy Society and Solder the Podcast. Special thanks to Shavana Lachlan for voicing our intro. And this whole mess is my fault. I'm Noah Nelson, and until next time, I'll see you at the show. <laughs>